Okay, so I'm Natalie Phillips, and I'm an English professor. <coughs> but today I'm here to talk about the work I'm doing in the new field of literary neuroscience, where art meets science daily on the ground and in my everyday life, and in fact so often that I no longer separate them. So for those who've been talking about this. Um, so most of the time, I spend my life studying 18th century literature, particularly the history of distraction. Um, and that's my book. Um, but what I do when no one's looking is put students into brain scanners and make them read Jane Austen. <laughs> and so, so this means living in an interdisciplinary space where I speak both languages, um, often talking about pride and prejudice and the prefrontal cortex in the same day or running from a class um, in English to the radiology building um, to work out what kind of scan we're going to run and exactly what triggers will be um, linked, will it be slices or volumes. Um, but my main message for today is that in flipping between these hats, um, is that bringing insights and methods from the humanities to the sciences um, has the power to transform both fields. So, this is the model that I live by in my research, my teaching, and in my lab, um, which you've heard about digital humanities and literary cognition. Um, and, but the lab, just to sort of say why I'm so excited about it, it brings together students in particular, and faculty, but students in English, neuroscience, medicine, neuroscience, medicine digital humanities, music therapy, law, and, and so many more, um, but to do cutting edge work in the neuroscience of reading music and the arts, and to come back the talk just before, um, you know, this is a this is this means that students are doing um, are actively contributing to this research um, at an interdisciplinary, an interdisciplinary level, um, and they're actually advancing. I would say as much as, if not more than, uh, this work more, more than our global collaborators do, which I think really makes it a model of hands-on interdisciplinary education um, that we can look at and that doesn't necessarily fit within the formal boundaries of the classroom, but in a, a different sort of space where it's actually advancing new projects. So okay, so today I'll be talking about three experiments that are going on at the lab right now. So ready? Quickly. Um, there's one on the neuroscience of novel reading. There's another on the pleasures of poetry um, in collaboration with NYU and a bunch of other people. And a final one on the stories we hear uh, in music, recently funded by the NSF. So, um, so in the first case, um, an fMRI study of literary attention in Austin, now known in the media as your brain on Jane. Um, it was bringing a question from literature that was not about Austin, um, that was about attention and the levels of attention that we in fact bring to any literary work and what captures our attention, but also the fact that we can bring different levels of attention to reading at all, um, that in fact uh, led completely by accident, um, bringing these questions from literature to neuroscience, um, meant that we ended up totally by accident becoming the first fMRI study of real-time natural reading. In other words, letting people read a real novel at their own speed inside the scanner. In our next project, I'm not going to show you any of the uh, results. So in our next project, a collaboration with NYU um, and UVN and other people, we moved from novels to poetry, exploring which moments um, in literature people love or don't um, as they're reading. So we can think back to Elaine's talk here um, on art as an outlet and then thinking about expressing the complex feelings of a migraine or a sense of joy or sadness um, in a flower. But we're doing this, you could say, in reverse digging into the sort of ebb and flow of these sort of intricate emotions in real time as we engage with that work of art. Here it's a work of poetry, but, um, and so that means, so we're just moving this in uh, project into the scanner and this gift makes it look like, you know, everybody just loves things, um, but they don't, they mix it up. Um, but basically exploring these kinds of literary questions about our emotional responses to art and neuroaesthetics pushed us again to create new experiments and models for using fMRI. Here a program that lets people highlight and actually see their responses um, to poetry inside the brain scanner in real time, and then will let us analyze them. So. This is sort of to say that fMRI, the MRI can fragment the brain, 
um, but that I believe that there are also ways to integrate them by, in fact, through art um, in another way. And that being able to do real-time reading and think about um, how we can look at real-time reading inside the scanner um, has the potential to create better, more individualized diagnostic tools um, for thinking about all sorts of things involved with our, our reading disorders. Um, so dyslexia, learning disorders, ADHD, all of this, um, that would actually be attached to that individual's specific ways and styles of reading or engaging with art or music. In our latest experiment, we've gone global. Um, so we're working with folks from the University of Arkansas to the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and excitingly, or intimidatingly, um, this is the first study on narrative perceptions of music. And as it turns out, um, an astonishing number of people hear stories when they listen to music without words. And what's still more interesting is that um, often these music-inspired stories have surprisingly similar themes. <laughs> like the cat and mouse one above, which is what shocked me into collaboration, um, which has, I would like to just suggest, um, critical implication for anyone doing music therapy in medicine or talking about the healing power right, of, of music because if the kinds of stories people are imagining while listening about love or loss or about cat mouse chases or ominous battles, in fact, may reshape the type of music that we use in therapeutic contexts depending on that knowledge. And also how, especially if this varies by culture, which is part of what we're exploring um, in collaboration with our collaborators in China. So, you know, keep on. So the idea for our next round of experiments grew out of an actual, uh, an, uh, something that was not experimental, um, an accessible art exhibition we created last November at the Broad um, that is thinking about disability studies and neurodiversity. So here, students in English collaborated with student painters and sculptors to create tactile artworks um, designed to make museum art accessible to people along the visual disability spectrum. So as well as everyone else, as you can see, kids love to touch art too, as do all of us. Um, and there's an example at the back um, that you should feel free to get your hands on. Um, it's called The Night is a Carnival of Wings, um, created by one of the students in our lab who is both an artist and a scientist and going into art therapy. Anyway, so we, we did a lot of things involved with this. We, um, the art was inspired by right, works of literature, which were presented in Braille, as well as right, th interpreted through the tactile art. Um, and then we also had audio recordings as well. And so thinking about reading music and art beyond the visual has really expanded our definition of reading, um, as well as our research on it in the lab. And so just to sort of throw things out, I think that this work, that particular event, um, like the talks today, um, have me thinking about a whole new set of things, um, wondering about how um, the, the new kinds of bridges and collaborations that we can um, create that actually appreciate these intersections between art, medicine, and disability studies in future grants, medical treatments, and outreach, and beyond. Thank you guys so much.